What she's trying to do in that book is to show how the poor were moralized. Poverty wasn't just viewed as inevitable human condition or something that you know, if you were poor, that you deserved to be so forever, that there was something about you intrinsically that condemned you to poverty. Welcome to Acton Line, a product of the Acton Institute for the Study of Religion and Liberty. I'm Eric Cohn, executive producer. Gertrude Himmelfarb was one of the foremost historians of Victorian life. She produced page-turning biographies of some of the age's most intriguing and influential figures, including Lord Acton, Charles Darwin, John Stuart Mill, and George Eliot. She also produced social histories of the period and brought a Victorian sensibility to American politics as a leading conservative public intellectual. In this episode, Acton's librarian and research associate, Dan Huger, speaks with Nicole Penn, author of an essay just published in National Affairs entitled The Historian's Craft, which deftly explores the life and legacy of one of the conservative movement's most accomplished women. You can find additional resources in the show notes for this episode, as well as find previous episodes of Acton Line on our website at acton.org slash actonline. And if you like this program, you can help us reach even more listeners by sharing it with a friend and leaving us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. We welcome your comments as well. Act in Line is available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. Welcome. My name is Dan Huger, Librarian and Research Associate at the Acton Institute. Today I am joined by Nicole Penn, Senior Program Manager at the American Enterprise Institute. She is also a doctoral student in history at George Mason University, She's also a former research assistant to Lynn Cheney. Today, we'll be discussing her essay in the latest edition of National Affairs, The Historian's Craft. It's a delightful and thought-provoking essay which examines the nature of history and the historian's vocation through the life and work of American historian Gertrude Himmelfarb. Nicole, welcome to Act in Line, and thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. So Gertrude Himmelfarb was an extraordinary and accomplished woman, uh, both as a historian and as a public intellectual, uh, but also very underappreciated by, by too many historians today and, and forgotten by, by too many public intellectuals today, I think. Uh, as a young scholar, where did you first encounter Himmelfarb and what sort of impression did she make on you? Um, yeah, so that's a great question. I met um, Gertrude Himmelfarb um, when I was a research assistant at AEI back in 2018. She had attended, she was attending an event that we were hosting with Leon Cass um, on his latest book, I think, Leading uh, Worthy Lives. And um, I had been asked by a senior fellow here, Carlin Bowman, if, you know, because uh, B was in her uh, mid 90s at this point, if I'd be willing to accompany her home after the program was over, um, just to be in the Uber with her and to make sure that she got home safely. So, um, so, uh, and I had known about B's work. I knew that she was a historian. And that was something that really piqued my interest because um, when I started working as a research assistant for Lynn, I was, um, I had a master's in history. I was trained as a historian. I was working with uh, Dr. Cheney on this history of the Virginia dynasty. And I was, you know, being exposed to this world of, um, you know, female historians that are working in the uh, conservative intellectual space. So I just jumped at the chance when uh, Carlin asked me to, to take her home. And so, um, you know, the event ends, um, we we pack her into the Uber and it was so cold. It was such a cold night, I remember. And she was so, um, she struck me as so frail in some ways, but the minute we got into the Uber, and this was totally coincidental, I just happened to be reading Middlemarch. Oh, sees wonderful. Copy, <laughs> she sees a copy of Middlemarch in my bag and we have this lovely conversation about Middlemarch and um, especially about... Fred Vinci and Mary Garth and their relationship, which tends to be, I think, under discussed as part of like the interweaving and complicated plots that are happening in Middlemarch. 
and um, really pulling out what um, Elliot is trying to say through their relationship. And that conversation, she was so lucid and so bright and lovely. And then, you know, the Uber ride is over. Um, I see her into her uh, apartment at the Watergate. And before she leaves, she says, um, actually, she didn't, she didn't say this to me. She emailed me the next day and said, I wanted to thank you for accompanying me home, escorting me home last night. I have a couple books for you. If you want to come back to the Watergate, um, you can pick them up at the front desk. So I marched my way over and I and I have two signed copies. And the two books that she gave me were um, The Moral Imagination mm -hmm. and Roads to Modernity. And so I just felt like that was really fortuitous and they're just such wonderful books. And especially after I read, I mean, The Moral Imagination is just this gem of a book. It's her going through um, these, uh, I think it's really the people and the, the thinkers, um, the intellectuals that have resonated with her the most. It's a kind of like capstone piece in some ways. Um, where she explores is a collection of essays on um on different um intellectuals. She has a great chapter on George Eliot um and Middlemarch. But um Roads of Modernity really had me thinking about how she conceives of history and the connection between the historian and public conversations. And so I kind of was just like, you know, thinking about that more and more over the years. And I finally just decided to write something out of it and to delve into her work as a historian. Yeah, that's 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 wonderful. And it's it's Middlemarch is just a, a great meeting point for Gertrude Himmelfarb. And it's like actually also a great intersection that, that Gertrude Himmelfarb and Lord Acton have, because Eliot is one of Acton's favorite novelists. And of course, she, she wrote a very famous biography of Lord Acton, Lord Acton, a, a study in conscience and politics. But getting back to this this historian's craft, you begin your essay by discussing the sort of training that historians typically receive today. What does that training look like and how is it different from the sort of training that Himmelfarb herself received at the University of Chicago as a student in the 1940s? Because um, I think that, that, that's like sort of the contrast you open up with your essay in. And I think that's it's very illuminating. Um, both, uh, And I think it's, it's a great nugget to open this exploration with. Yeah, um, that's another great question. Um, so the kind of, you know, introductory course that you will get when you are starting a graduate program, whether it's a master's student or a doctoral student, is this, it's it's usually called the historian's craft. And it's a class that's really by historiography. It's looking, it's zooming out and looking at the various trends in the field and how different historians have um, developed new methodologies, new theories. Um, it's It's the history of history. Um, and what doesn't typically accompany something like this, at least not in my experience, is a class along the lines of what um, Gertrude Himmelfarb describes in the opening to The New History and the Old, this um, work that she published, where she kind of starts to dig into the various method methodological turns um, that are happening in the academy. And in this, this kind of this other class, she really was trained in the art of digging through sources and, um, you know, figuring out how to interpret sources, why um, sources matter. So she was given assignments like, you know, figuring out the time of day at which the sun rose on a particular day of the French Revolution. She, she admits in, in her essay, she's like, I don't really remember what the significance of this was, but I remember that it was significant. And it's this very, you know, material um, experience that she has. And the other key um, assignment that she gets, which is something that I um, myself experienced, but not in the context of the classroom, was she was tasked with fact-checking a piece of scholarship and going through all the footnotes, proving that they exist, proving that they were cited correctly, proving that um, they were interpreted correctly, that any claims that were made in a paragraph were um, su supported by the evidence that the historian is, is sourcing. And that is such an invaluable, I, I cannot express how invaluable that kind of training is. And I got that training myself, not in the classroom when I was at William and Mary. I got it um, as an editorial apprentice at the Omohundro Institute, which is um, a uh, very leading and important uh, scholarly uh, publication coming out of William and Mary. They focus on early American studies. And as an editorial apprentice, I had to go through the same thing. Um, what the OI does is they um, go through, when they receive a manuscript, they go through a very rigorous fact-checking process that is run by these editorial apprenti. And um, 
And that was the skill set that I was able to bring when I was hired at AEI in 2016 as a research assistant for Lynn Cheney, um, because she wanted me to do the exact same thing, is to go through her manuscript, check footnotes, make sure that any claims she was making were backed up by evidence. And these are the building blocks of the profession. So it's kind of, it was just interesting to me to realize that yes, I had cultivated these skills, but I, that was not something that I experienced in the classroom in the same structured way that it seems that um, B. Himmelfarb had been uh, had been uh, expected to 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 do. This resonates so much with my experience. I mean, I remember taking a historiography class, and we'd read things like Nietzsche's on the advantages and disadvantages of history for life, and those are like very interesting and very helpful. But yeah, where I actually picked up the sort of nuts and bolts stuff was later editorial work for Acton. You know, we, we reissued a book by Lester DeCoster called Communism and the Christian Faith that he wrote for this sort of introductory series for Erdman's publishing. And as a result, he has all these direct quotes, but no footnotes. But we at Acton had inherited his library of some 10,000 volumes. So I'm digging through all these Soviet era Marxist published tax and tracking that down. And that was really fun and really, uh, really enjoyable and really valuable. But it's not what I received in my history education. And it's and it's very much this is also um, Gertrude Himmelfarb in her biography of Acton talks about Acton's formation as a historian with his teacher Dullinger and going to archives and actually sifting through documentation and knowing that, the, the, you know, reading this, uh, reading your piece brought this all back to me and how much this must have resonated with her as she was writing that book. Um, you, be, yeah. you make a very astute observation uh, that, that, Himmelfarb was a historian of ideas, yet she was a historian first. And part of that is the sort of nuts and bolts work we were just talking about. But it's bigger than that. Um, maybe, you know, for, for, for listeners who aren't historians, could you, could you sort of orient them to what, what it is as a historian of, what is a historian of ideas? And what traps are very, very easy for historians of ideas to fall into, and and how does Himmelfarb negotiate that and avoid some of those traps in her own research and writing? Yeah, that's a, another great question. Um, so I can tell you a little bit of the context where that <laughs> that line in my piece comes from. Um, I was talking to uh, to Yuval Levin, uh, my boss here at AEI, um, and I don't know how seriously he meant this, but he he said something like. We were talking about B, and he said something like, well, you know, if she had been at Chicago 10 years later, she probably would have just been a political theorist. And that just <laughs> kind of stuck with me. Yeah. And I was like, I'm not, I'm not so sure about that. And that's another impetus for the piece is I really wanted to take her seriously as a historian of ideas. And I think that's almost just like a professional reaction to I work with a lot of political theorists and a lot of political scientists here at AEI, and they are wonderful. I mean, something that's really key to me um, that's become clear to me is that political theorists and historians need each other. We um, look at the past in different ways, but that um, can illuminate each other ultimately. But, you know, um, I think when it comes to be as a historian of ideas, um, I think what's important is that she takes she 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 takes ideas seriously, but she wants to ground them in the material space that um, from whence they were born. And I think what um, what what the intervention that she has and that historian of historians of ideas have is that um, it's very you know something might seem very clear cut on paper. But once those ideas start working their ways through a society, um, there's a lot of tensions that they have to encounter. Um, and even within an individual, there's a lot of tensions between what an individual writes at one point in their life and how they think about sometimes those very same ideas at a different point in their life. And that kind of evolution, I think, um, uh, historians of ideas can be very um, can be very sensitive to. Um, she really said that she she wanted to write her book on Acton as a way to push back against those who would try to systematize his thought in a way that she thought was um, was inappropriate or perhaps um, 
would would take away from a from a real grappling with him as a person. Um, but I do think what you know a trap that perhaps a historian of ideas can fall into um, because historians are trying to do so much, and because you know she focused really on a lot of biographies. She wrote these biographies of Victorian intellectuals, so she could really just concentrate on one individual at a time. As you start zooming out. Um, the place where we we need perhaps the political theorists or we need people who can spend the time just really sitting with ideas um, and going through um, a a work um, an intellectual work really carefully um, because historians are trying to rebuild I think an entire society from the ground up so that we can understand how ideas percolate through that society and it's just kind of a question of time there's only so much time that you can devote to either enterprise. Yeah, they, when you mention these these individual and personal tensions, and this is one one of the things I love about the Acton biography. One of the things the uh, she, other early biographies she does one of Darwin that's fascinating, and she does one of John Stuart Mill, um, and these are all very interesting books, and they're very personal books. They're sort of warts and all presentations of these figures. And it's not to sort of, you know, glory in their weirdness or their strangeness, but it's a way of getting at really understanding and unpacking those ideas um, in a way that that only historians can do. This isn't, you know, these, these people, even though they produce works that may contain syllogisms, uh, their thought as a whole isn't always laid out like that. Um, she makes she makes a remark very early on in the Acton biography about how we're just now, and this is in 1952, coming to understand what Lord Acton meant. And she's very serious in this. And she, in the appendix to that biography, she goes through previous work on Acton and describes sort of why she finds it inadequate. Um, and there's some funny stuff. She's also genuinely funny in these books. Um, but she thinks she thinks that there's something about this sifting that even Lord Acton's own contemporaries really didn't take the time to do, that they were kind of just in awe of the man's erudition um, and were kind of like taken captive by it in some sense, in some cases, aggravated by it in other cases, but nobody really, it took a long time and someone like Himmelfarb to really wrestle through um, the complexities of the man and his thought. When you think of biographies, and, and this is, I guess, I guess, is a general question, which takes us a little bit, a little bit further afield from from B. But a lot of folks, they where they touch history is in biographies. A lot of you know, if you know, if you run into someone in the street and you introduce yourself as a historian, and they're thrilled, and sometimes this happens, but a lot of times they're thrilled because they've read captivating biographies about historical figures that interest them. Is that a lot of historians are dismissive of these popular biographies, um, but I think there's something really too, particularly understanding ideas and navigating that through the form of the bi biography that I think B really took to heart and really made the center of a lot of her life's work. What, where, where do you think as a historian of, of the place of biography in, in the historian's craft? I love biographies. Um, I think biographies are such a useful window into a society. Um, I mean, not just understanding, you know, an individual life, which I just, which I do think is so important. Um, I, I think there is sort of a moral imperative. I mean, that's, that's a whole other conversation perhaps we can get into is, you know, what is the, what's the historian's relationship to, to morality. But I, I do think why I love history so much is because there's a real love of humanity that I think, in, you know, drives most historians and biographies a great way to really, um, you know, interrogate a human life and then open a window into the world in which that life um, was uh, was carried out um, in a way that is really accessible to a lot of people. And I do think that's really important for history is I, I think um, history, is, it's about stories and you should be um, I think historians should be careful to not just, I mean, it's important that we have conversations with each other and um, to really engage with each other in ways that are um, 
you know, advancing the the sum of knowledge, um, those conversations are going to look a little bit different than conversations that we have perhaps with the public. But we should never forget, I think, the public audience. Um, and I also think um, I, I reviewed a work by James Marcus. It was a biography of um, uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson recently, and something that came through in his his biography. Um, and he's not quite. I don't. I'm not sure he's that he's formally trained as a historian. But what I really enjoyed about his biography is he was very honest about how the life that he was studying had these moments of resonance with his own life. And I think that's what's happening with B too and her study of Acton. Is Acton is a historian as well. And I think she was mining a lot um, from Acton's life uh, to better understand herself as a historian, even if she had moments of disagreement. Um, I mean, talk about sharp writing. Uh, she, everyone, I mean, another reason I just want to write this piece is I want people to read B. She's yes. a magnificent writer. She's so good. Um, she, in fact, I think she's profiled in this new book that just came out by Ronnie Greenberg called Write Like a Man. And it's about the New York Jewish intellectual set um, from the 1960s. And um, I think they really, she's just, she's so sharp and she's so, you know, kind of, a acerbic, but in a really well-crafted way. Um, so I want people to read her, but, um, you know, when, when you read her discussing Acton, there is clearly a lot of admiration there, but there's, it's not completely, un, it's not hagiography. That's the important part. Those are, it's, she's, she's really grappling with, with his ideas. She's very honest, for example, about how in his perhaps most Burkean phase of his life, because people do change over time. Oh, yeah. And there's a clear example of this in, in some of the most Burkean stages of his life. He kind of offers this, this defense of the Confederacy. Yes, um, and corresponds yeah. with General Lee. And, and corresponds with General Lee. And um, she has this line where she's discussing that. Um, and I just want to quote it because I just – I. <laughs> In nowhere in the letter did Acton feel it necessary to introduce the disagreeable question of slavery. Just kind of like cutting, but in a very subtle way. It's very B. And I really, that really made me more enamored of her because of her ability to, to um, present his life so um, honestly and to combine admiration with appropriate criticism. Yeah, and this is and this is actually this is this is a great uniting point because you brought up this 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 moral question and the and the idea of you know the historian is it appropriate for a historian to be a moralist um, and and act and you know you have you have great moralist novelists like George Eliot uh, this is what captivates both Himmelfarb and Acton uh, about her. But a lot of folks, you know, when I was, I, I edited a single volume anthology of, of Lord Acton and I was working with another, another uh, historian at the time who was doing editorial work for Acton. And he asked me, you know, what, what do you think about this, 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 this moralism. And I said, I said, you know, I'm a big fan and I gave my arguments, but he was a very much more conventional, you know, this is not the way that historians talk today. Um, this is not the language of a sort of value neutral science that a lot of people, um, a lot of people like today. And Himmelfarb with those sort of remarks is also revealing something of her own, her own moralism. Although this is something that she thinks Acton takes too far. In fact, in his personal relationships in his life, what do you think of that interplay? Because there's there's interesting levels in which it's going on as Gertrude Himmelfarb is examining Acton and she's examining these questions, but then also making these judgments as her as herself. Where do you think she falls on this question? Yeah, um, I think that's so important, and I think we kind of we don't sometimes ask the right questions about the role of moralism in history. Um, I take. I, I kind of believe that the moralism is inevitable. I think it's impossible for us to play this completely disinterested role when we look at the past. Um, we are shaped by our environments, our moral commitments. Um, it's part of being human. I think it's it's kind of an inhuman expectation to suggest that we can just stand outside of it. Um, but I think, on the other hand, it's difficult to be a good historian if you can't, to some degree, participate in this empathetic exercise. Um, there was a 
book I was reading recently um, by Laurel Ulrich, um, Houseful of Women. It's about these female polygamists in Utah who come out in favor of women's suffrage in Utah territories in the 1870s. And um, the the Ulrich is, is trying to figure out how could these women, you know, seek voting rights, but also want to use those rights to defend polygamy. But her book is this like really beautiful, empathetic exercise in understanding these women. Um, and I feel that B in many ways is part of that uh, tradition in historical writing where you can't really judge the past, you know, uh, carefully or or in a nuanced way if you don't actually like try to participate in this um in this essential empathetic exercise. So I think I, I say in the piece, I think she was, um, and it's funny because Acton in some ways becomes more radical than Dollinger, his mentor. Oh yes. Theologian Dollinger. Um, Dollinger really thinks that there's this asymptote that you reach after a while um, where, you know, truth exists, but you know, there's, there is an asymptote at which we can't quite, you know, really fully comprehend the truth. Um, but act is just so much more uncompromising. And, and I think if there's one thing that I wish B had really grappled with, there's this fragment from the 1880s. I think it's in the Acton Crichton correspondence that was published by Liberty Fund, where it's not, I'm not sure it's a letter. I think it's just a fragment or some notes that he wrote to himself. It's a bunch of aphorisms that so Rufus, Acton writes about history. So Rufus Fears, in the, in the third volume of that set from Liberty Fund, which is a, which is a fabulous set, um, the half of that third volume is just collections from unpublished notes that Fears finds at Cambridge and arranges topically. And they're wonderful. They're a goldmine. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I guess it must come from that. Um, but Acton has this, <laughs> these notes, which I, w- I would have read an essay where, where I wish he had just written an essay on these notes. Because Acton says, advice to persons about to write history, don't. Visit the <laughs> <laughs> Visit the Monte Purgatorio, as Austin called the magnesian rock that yields Epsom salt. So, and he and he also has this other note: the ethics of history cannot be denominational. Um, the greatest crime is homicide. He has these very sharp. He kind of delineates his whole theory of history to me in these these aphoristic notes. Um, and on the one hand, you know, you do want to be sympathetic. And I I do respect, and I think B respects really the fight that he is having with the Catholic Church in the um, 19th century and the fight that he's having with other historians who would prefer to whitewash some of the atrocities of the Inquisition. Um, and and he's kind of an underappreciated character um, in this in this moment uh, in religious history. Um, but on the other hand, um, you know, it's, again, there's this empathetic exercise that it's interesting that Acton, as he gets older, it's very counterintuitive as he gets older, he just becomes so much more inflexible, um, in his willingness to extend that to, um, to societies or individuals that violate these like core principles. Um, so I think it's just a matter of, it's a matter of acknowledging the trade-offs, um, I think, in historical writing um, about how you apply moralism. Um, I think the one thing I'll, I'll just conclude just from these these aphorisms that, that Acton has, but the last one he has is, history deals with life, religion with death, much of its work and spirit escapes our ken. And I think that's just... It, that's like that moment of intellectual humility. I think that's where, you know, B's careful moralism, especially in the, you know, between the 1960s to the 1990s, um, it's it's about recognizing this, um, the, the fact that we don't, even in our own morals, you know, we are imperfect people and we um, we have to have some intellectual humility about that. Yeah, there's, there's a line in uh, Acton's... Uh inaugural lecture at Cambridge that he delivers very late in his life as he becomes more rigid about these things. There's no question about that. Um, in which he 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 quotes the, I think it's the Duke de Bourgueil, um, and he says that, you know, you have to be careful that too much explaining doesn't lead to too much excusing. 
And he really thinks, and this is, this is in that famous act in Creighton correspondence, this begins with a hostile review that Acton gives to a book that Creighton publishes in which he excoriates Creighton for not making these sorts of moral judgments that he thinks should be made. Uh, Creighton responds in the most generous way possible and they become fast friends um, after it. But it's really, you know, Creighton makes the first friendly move <laughs> in that exchange and it's, it's, it's fascinating to see. One of the things that I was thinking about in preparation for this conversation, and I was actually thinking about it as I was going through your piece, is in the very early days of the Acton Institute, uh, Gertrude Himmelfarb wrote an essay for one of our publications on um, uh, on the deserving and undeserving poor as a category, uh, as categories, which is kind of an outworking of a work that you examine very closely um, in your piece uh, on the idea of poverty. Um, this is uh, this is Himmelfarb in a much different mode than as a biographer and a more sort of a, a more of a that sort of material history that we were talking about earlier that she brings to the table. That's more foregrounded in this work. Um, what about that work is fascinating to you and, and, and what do you think its contribution is there? Yeah, so there was a reason I, I picked the books that I picked to, um, you know, offer up this it, what I hoped was a was a useful introduction to her thought and her work as a historian, because um, a lot of folks talk about the demoralization of society um, and the and she was really prolific in the 1990s. But I was fascinated by the idea of poverty because it's not just a biography of an individual. It's this um, it's it's a social history of an idea. And she's pulling not just from these key figures, um, Thomas Malthus and Smith. Um, uh, you know, uh, males, these, these various individuals that were, that were starting to conceive of poverty as a problem, but she also looks at the various interstitial intellectual layers, um, chartreuse pamphleteers, uh, novelists, um, journalists, um, you know, uh, London's, uh, laboring poor Henry, Henry Mayhew's, I think I'm getting that right. Um, and she's, she's looking at this conversation that is happening about poverty. And yes, it's driven by, you know, one thing that she's very clear is she, she dearly wishes that she had the direct testimony from the poor themselves of what the, you know, how they thought about their own, you know, condition. Um, but it's just, it's hard to find those, those, um, sources, so she, and, and I think this is a really important point that she makes. Um, and this actually, I'm not sure that she makes this point in idea of poverty, but she makes it in the new history in the old, that to say that politics is just the purview of the elite is a very condescending understanding of politics um, because it refuses to acknowledge the possibility that the poor or working classes would not have you know, that the politics somehow didn't involve them or didn't impact their lives or didn't shape their lives. So she's, um, the idea of poverty takes this uh, social history of ideas, um, which I think is still uh, a, a pretty useful and, and prominent thread in intellectual history. I think it's in some ways the best marriage of, um, of uh, intellectual history with, with the kind of material work that historians can do. And, um, and, and she, she makes this really compelling point that, you know, it's not inevitable that poverty would have been conceived as a problem, but, um, but that it does in the 19th century is just this like really remarkable sign of the influence of turns in British thought that um, really uh, emphasize the universality of the moral sense and the responsibility that we had, we have to it each other as um, as equal human beings that have this capacity for the moral sense. And then of course you do get into these complications and even she admits that, you know, Victorian solutions to the problem of poverty were not always adequate to the scale of the problem. And there is this um, tension between the deserving and undeserving poor. But I think what she's trying to do in that book is to show how the poor were moralized um, and they weren't just viewed poverty wasn't just viewed as inevitable human condition or something that um that 
you know, if you were poor, that you deserve to be so forever, that there was something about you intrinsically that condemned you to poverty. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's fascinating the way she digs into those sources. All of these things that we sort of take for granted today in our politics, in our conversations about, about, about social life are things that have their own history and, and, and be sort of sort of really digs in and sifts through that in an illuminating way. One of the tensions you point out in your essay, and you point it out in a couple different places, but particularly in your treatment of, of the new history and the old, is her role in sort of explaining history to the American conservative movement that, you know, um, has sometimes a complicated relationship to history. Um, and and sort of she's doing that on the one hand. On the other hand, she's also sort of explaining to historians <laughs> um, what the conservative movement is um, throughout her career. How do you, how does that? How do you view that hinge in her life as 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 public intellectual and historian? Because she never really takes off one hat and puts on another. Um, there's really a lively interplay of both throughout her career. Yeah, um, absolutely. Uh, I mean, I think that's one of the other things that uh, that fascinates me about her is that she, you know, she retained the identity of as historian throughout her life. Um, and yes, she has a lot of frustrations with, you know, social history, with quanto history, with psycho history, with a lot of these methodological innovations that. Um, dominate the the 1980s um, and 90s, uh, gender, race, um, class. Um, she she has her qualms with those frameworks. Um, but on the other hand, I think she's just, she's so formed by the profession and part of her must love it, even though she sometimes talks about it in these very disparaging terms. Um, she, she calls, you know, she calls, she says she has a professional deformation. <laughs> um, <laughs> That's a great. I have a professional deformation as a historian. Where I'm like, B, no, history is wonderful, but um, but that that philosophers can see, you know, the uh, the underlying verities of history. That political theorists and uh, political scientists can see the the. Um, the frameworks within which uh, history works itself out, but historians can only see the ineluctable facts of history, which I love because ineluctable is a word for, you know, unavoidable. Like these are these things you have to grapple with. And I think, you know, when she's talking to conservatives, um, I think what she wants to make sure is that, you know, if conservatism is about preserving something about the past, she wants to ensure that conservatives are taking the past seriously. And, and part of what my essay, what I was trying to do in highlighting her thought in this regard is, you know, like I said, I work with a lot of political theorists. I work with a lot of political scientists. I see a lot of, um, you know, I, uh, uh, I supervise a team of research assistants here at AEI. So I see a lot of resumes from young people coming through. And I do worry sometimes just because I see a lot of, you know, political theory majors, political science majors, um, a lot of uh, great books um, emphasis and great books are wonderful. Great books. I mean, reading Little March changed my life. I, I won't discount that, but um, great books don't just appear, you know, out of thin air. They are grounded. Uh, they are the, the the product of a of a of a mind uh, of a mind that's um, encased in a in a body that's encased in a society. And I just think that um, her charge to historians uh, to conservatives about taking the ineluctable facts of history seriously, I think, is a is is a really important point to emphasize because the past is complicated and if we're if there's a tradition that's worth preserving it's important to to understand how that you know how that tradition has developed over time and what were the positive and negative implications of that of that tradition yeah there's a critical spirit there that is so often I absent in the conservative movement. I think I think to its detriment. I was reminded when I was when I was when I was reading through this 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 line of professional deformation. There is um there's a great a great podcast by Amit Varma called uh, uh, 
<clears throat> the Seen and the Unseen. It's mostly about India. And he was discussing with a great biography, Vinay Siddhapati, uh, I forget if it was his book. He did a biography of Prime Minister Rao. He also did a book that's sort of the history of the BJP before Modi. But he's very careful in that conversation to say that he's a journalist in a political science and not a historian. And then he goes on this long discursus about how historians take these ideological methods and then they sift through the data with those methods. And he's like, you know, and I'm, I'm just interested in, in sort of cause and effect. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just laughing because this is something that would sound ridiculous to somebody who's not exposed to this world of history. Of course, you know, what, what do you mean that historians are trying to figure out what happened and why. Um, but you but it does, it can sort of sort of seize hold of people like that. And and it shaped the discipline in in ways that are very mixed, um, like like history's assessments itself. Now what one of the things one of the things when we talk about um, Gertrude Himmelfarb and her role in history. We haven't brought up her husband yet. It was uh, Irving Kristol, um, who has very distinguished contributions in his in his own life as sort of the the founder of what of what people call neoconservatism. Now today, people say neoconservatism and they mean all sorts of things. Um, and I think that I think there is there is perhaps no aspect of the conservative movement that is more misunderstood today than neoconservatism. And, and Gertrude Himmelfarb is at the center of this particular strain of conservatism her whole life um, through both her own work and, 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 uh, and her connections with her husband's work. What is where, – where, where, how, does, how does Gertrude Himmelfarb fit into that neoconservatism – and how is her conservatism different um, in in its in its emphasis or 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 in its tenor than the broader conservative movement that's that's taking shape during her life through the fifties, sixties, seventies, eighties, nineties? Yeah. Um, well, you know, she and uh, and Irving were part of what Daniel Bell called the best marriage of their generation. And it was not just, a, I think, a reflection of, you know, how um, how how much they truly were soulmates, um, but they were intellectual soulmates and they learned from each other. But I, I almost wonder if and I maybe maybe Irving himself would have admitted this, that she um, just really played a formative role in his thought. And Irving was he was, you know, a, a journalist and um, he was uh, engaged in the debates, like really actively engaged in the public policy debates of the 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s. Um, whereas, you know, B was, I think, uh, up until the 90s, when she starts writing much more as a public intellectual, she really still is a historian. She's working in the academy um, and she's writing um, these histories of these Victorian intellectuals. She's um, engaging with debates within the academy. So, and, and I think with, with neoconservatism, a very common mis, um, I don't know if it's like a misconception, but it's a mistaken emphasis is that neoconservatism is just this, um, this approach to foreign policy when when it really is um you know a way of thinking about conservatism that takes into significant account um uh domestic policy and how we think about civil society and um the acknowledgement that um that you know there is such a thing, you know, societies do need to change, they need to evolve, but it's about a tempered, responsible evolution that doesn't lose sight of the of developments in tradition or, or an established tradition that um, has elements that are very much worth preserving. And I think by taking the past seriously, um, Himmelfart, and by looking at how this, com this community in the past um, that Victorians grappled with, and, and you know, in the long scheme of things, we are not that divorced from the from the Victorians. Um, you know, they're only only a couple centuries separate us from them. And in many ways, the problems that they grappled with were similar. I think similar, but not. You know, history does not repeat itself; it rhymes. I, I definitely endorse that, and I think B would too. But that um, the gulf 
separating her society from the Victorian society was not so large that there weren't things that um, one that you couldn't learn by looking at how they answered these um, these questions of you know how do you how do you support um, the indigent the poor without miring them in a destructive cycle of poverty um, and how do you even conceive and define poverty in the first place you know why is it something that um, you know the combination of voluntary societies and the state has a responsibility to ameliorate. Um, and I think by by taking the past seriously, she's she she introduced the answers that were given to by the Victorians into um, the the contemporary debates that um, her husband and the circle of intellectuals that she was a part of were engaged in in the late twentieth century. I think that's I think that's I think that's wonderful. There's 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 a there's a heart to this, I think, that, that Yuval Levin wrote a piece um, actually for Religion and Liberty, which is Acton's, Acton's quarterly magazine a while ago. Great uh, piece on Gertrude Himmelfarb and, and he entitled it, you know, Historian of the Liberal Paradox. And he takes this great section for, uh, or this, this great quotation from, from uh, Gertrude Himmelfarb's biography of John Stuart Mill. Uh, that he that he says is basically the, the most concise form she puts this paradox into, and she as 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 she wrestled with it throughout her career, and I'll, I'll just quote that that passage now. Uh, having made an absolute of liberty and having established the individual as sovereign, the liberal has no integrated view of the individual in society, which can moderate either his passion for liberty or his desire for regulation and control and control. When liberty proves inadequate, government rushes in. And since the only function assigned to government by the principle of liberty is the negative one of protection against injury, when government is obliged to assume a positive role, neither its proper powers nor its proper limits have been defined. The paradox is inevitable. Government tends to become unlimited when liberty itself is thought to be unlimited. The paradox brings others in its wake while contemporary liberalism has enormously enhanced the roles of society, government, and the state, it has provided them with no principles of legitimacy. And I think that it's it's so striking to me because it's so very similar. I mean, I, I see why she's drawn to Acton when she is drawn to this. Acton, very famously, he has a piece called The Roman Question in which he, he sort of it's it just when I when I saw that that I thought immediately of this when Acton says there is a wide divergence and irreconcilable disagreement between the political notions of the modern world and that which is essentially the system of the Catholic Church. It manifests itself particularly in their contrary views, contradictory views of liberty and the functions of the civil power. The Catholic notion defining liberty not as the power of doing what we like, but as the right of being able to do what we ought denies that the general interests can supersede individual rights. It condemns, therefore, the theory of the ancient as well as the modern state. Thinking through this paradox is a lot of what's going on in the American conservative movement today. There are a lot of people that um, see the conservative movement as historically too individualist and they think that this is the that that the problems they see in the world today are due to this and um they've come up with more or less sophisticated ways of dealing with that problem what do you think the way that B wrestled with this throughout her life how do you think that's instructive to this thinking through that's going on within the American conservative movement today? Oof, what a question. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think um, if I can offer, um, you know, what might be an unsatisfactory answer, but I'm going to do my best. Um, I mean, I think what she does really appreciate in Acton's thought, and I myself, you know, maybe you can answer this more, you know, whether because Acton does treat liberty as a virtue and not just a vehicle for virtue, but I think he does so because it is in liberty that we can best 
you know, grapple or, or find our way to a to a theory of the good or a theory of the good life. Um, and he's very skeptical of power. I mean, you've got the famous aphorism, you know, uh, all power corrupts. Um, and so I think what B is is navigating as she studies the Victorians, as she thinks through the American, British, French Enlightenment um, in her book, The Roads of Modernity, maybe that's that's a good place to to bring this, is that um, there um, associ- a, a, a community that can allow associational life to flourish while acknowledging that as modernity um, creates material conditions that become more complicated, you know, requires, um, you know, a cooperation between voluntary associations and with um, established governments, um, you know, the one cannot lose sight, I think, of the other, but one cannot put their faith entirely in the state, especially when the state, as she knew, as a, as a woman who lived through the 20th century, um, the state can be mobilized for atrocious ends. Um, Acton saw that in the form of the Catholic Inquisition. Um, and I think maybe um, something that I, I really do appreciate of, in her thought as a historian is the, the attention she pays to religion, uh, to Methodism, um, mm-hmm. which is just this incredible movement that um, this this religious movement that really shapes um, both the, the British um, uh, both Great Britain and the United States. I mean, Methodism is a very powerful and important, it's, it's a religion of the heart, it's a very democratized religion, and it's responsible for a lot of voluntary associations that um, develop in the United States. Um, I, I sometimes wonder if B gives that development a little bit too much short shrift because, because she's concentrating on, on the British. Um, but um, so I think I think that's really the 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 heart of the, the the paradox, but it's a paradox that in some ways is is self-sustaining. I mean, you need a, you need liberty to create the space for people to choose to work with one another and to find common ground and common meaning. It can't be imposed from above through the threat of state violence. Um, and and religion often is an indispensable ally in in facilitating that um, that associational life, but. Um, but that also means you have to give people the the space, um, you know, in civil society to choose not to 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 find different routes to the good life that might be that might run counter to prevailing trends. Um, yeah. So I, I think I mean, this is a wonderful place to end because she's not only a historian of the liberal paradox, but she is also someone who holds those tensions. She holds those tensions between public and intellectual historians. She holds those tensions between freedom and responsibility. And she does it, she did it through her whole life uh, with just an immense grace. I'm, I'm so thrilled that when we opened, you had this wonderful story about B, because I have, I have only one wonderful story about B. And um, when I was working on an anthology, I had put together a little introduction for it, and I thought, you know what would be wonderful is it would be wonderful, and this is in 2017, so this is two years before B's passing. I go, it'd be wonderful if I could get her to write a foreword. So I write her, and I and I say, you know, I you know, I talk about how deeply I admire her work. I sent I send her what I'm what I'm going to do, the introduction that I've written, and she replies to me, which is the most kind and generous brush off I've ever gotten in my life. Which is that I can't think, you know, I I couldn't think what to add to your already very fine introduction, <laughs> and I just I literally I had it printed up and like pinned it to my key. Cubicle uh, uh, for years afterwards, um, and she was such a kind and gracious woman um, throughout her life. I we did an interview with Yuval Levin not too long after her passing, in which he shared many of the memories he had of her, and uh, it's it's wonderful. Um, it's wonderful the intellectual legacy that she had, but it's also wonderful to hear these stories of 
personal interactions with her. And thank you so much for, for sharing your appreciation of her on both of those levels with us today. This has been a wonderful conversation. We'll link, uh, we'll link to your essay um, in the in the show notes. There's a lot in that essay we weren't able to get to today, and it's, it's really wonderful. Um, and thank you. Thank you so much, Nicole, for joining us today. Well, thank you so much for your kind words. Um, I'm not surprised that you had uh, such a lovely encounter with me, even if it was just through writing. She was a really generous, um, she was, a, I think, a teacher just in every every instance of her life. And uh, And thank you for having me. As always, thank you for listening. Our team loves putting this podcast together for you. It's encouraging to hear from our listeners. Feedback is incredibly important to us because it lets us know what you'd like to hear more of, including the kinds of topics you're interested in most. If you have comments, feedback, or ideas for a show topic or interesting guest, you can email our team at producer at actin.org. Until next week, for Acton Line, I'm Eric Cohn.